<clears throat> you may be seated. This is our second uh, week in our journey through the Psalms. Last week, we explored a Psalm that invited, encouraged, commanded us to worship and praise Him. Um, today, we come to a Psalm that is quite a bit different in tone from last week. This Psalm is an angry Psalm. This Psalm is spoken by a poet, a man who calls on God for vengeance. So the emotion that animates this psalm is anger, and this psalm is a cry for vengeance. And it's odd, isn't it? It's odd to read something like this out of the Bible, because as we read, you'll hear it so clearly, the words of a human being, the words of a, of a man, a very human person with very human feelings of emotion and a desire for vengeance. And yet, yet, these human feelings, this human expression is in the Bible. And so in a sense, it is also the word of God. Listen for the word of the Lord. Do you indeed decree what is right, you gods? Do you judge people fairly? No. In your hearts, you devise wrongs. Your hands deal out violence on the earth. The wicked go astray from the womb. They err from their birth, speaking lies. They have venom like the venom of a serpent, like the deaf adder that stops its ear, so that it does not hear the voice of charmers or of the cunning enchanter. O oh God, break the teeth in their mouths. Tear out the fangs of the young lions, O oh Lord. Let them vanish like water that runs away. Let, like grass, let them be trodden down and wither. Let them be like the snail that dissolves into slime, like the untimely birth that never sees the sun. Sooner than your pots can feel the heat of the thorns, whether green or ablaze, may he sweep them away. The righteous will rejoice when they see vengeance done. They will bathe their feet in the blood of the wicked. People will say, surely there is a reward for the righteous, surely there is a God who judges on earth. This is the word of the Lord. Our, our anger and our desire for vengeance is a persistent theme in human history and in our lives. There's a joke about two ladies who had had a long stand. These two church ladies had a long standing fight. For years, they feuded these two church ladies with each other. And one new year, the beginning of a new year, these church ladies, they gathered in the fellowship hall and one lady said to the other, you know, it's a new year, and it's time, I think, to put an end to our bickering. Let's bring our feud to an end. Then she said, I want you to know that in the new year, I wish for you everything you wish for me. And then the other woman said, oh, so you're starting back up with me again. Our, our cycles, our vicious cycles of, of anger and resentment and our desire for vengeance against each other seems to have no end. And it's a very human impulse, anger, and a desire for revenge. Very human. And, and all throughout the Bible, even in the Old Testament, we, we find examples not just of this psalm, of, of a human calling for vengeance, but we find it elsewhere in the Old Testament too. Think of the great prophet Samuel. Samuel was the prophet who anointed David. Remember him? Well, after Israel had had a long war against the Amalekites, Israel finally defeated the Amalekites, finally defeated them. And this is what Samuel does. Then Samuel said, bring Agag, king of the Amalekites, here to me. And Agag came to him haltingly. Agag said, surely the bitterness of death is past. But Samuel said, as your sword has made women childless, so your mother shall be childless among women. And Samuel hewed Agag in pieces before the Lord in Gilgal. That's revenge. That's vengeance. But, but we have to remember this, that the Old Testament is the record of, of a people who were small and weak and most often victims. 
We Americans have to remember this when we read the Old Testament and we hear these calls for revenge and vengeance. We have to remember that Israel was nothing like us. Israel was never anything like America. Israel was never a great power. Israel was always the little kid on the block who was beaten and bullied by much larger, much more powerful enemies. So when in the Old Testament we hear cries for vengeance, we're hearing the cry of the small. We're hearing the cry of the weak against the powerful who oppress them. And in Christian teaching, though, anger, the emotion behind this psalm, anger is not always a sin. Did you know that? Anger is a neutral passion in Christian thinking. Anger can be a sin, but it can also be not a sin. Here's, here's Thomas Aquinas, maybe one of the greatest Christian theologians of all time. He writes about anger. He says, he that is angry without cause shall be in danger, right? And he defines sinful anger. He said, and Aquinas gives the best short definitions of everything. What is sinful anger? He says, it's the immoderate desire for vengeance, right? The immoderate desire for vengeance. But he goes on to say, yes, if you're angry irrationally, then that's a sin. But he says, but he that is angry with cause shall not be in danger. For without anger, teaching will be useless, judgments unstable, crimes unchecked. Therefore, to be angry is not always an evil. It's not always a sin to be angry. In fact, Aquinas goes on to say that it can actually be a sin not to be angry. To fail to be angry can be a sin. He says this, he who is not angry, whereas he has cause to be, sins. For unreasonable patience is the hotbed of many vices. It fosters negligence. It incites not only the wicked, but even the good to do wrong. In other words, when good men aren't angry, it allows wickedness to flourish. So it can be a sin not to be angry. Remember last Sunday when Nancy was up here talking about children in poverty, children raised with nothing to live on, nothing, nothing to eat, no resources to educate them? She quoted Nelson Mandela, and Nelson Mandela said, overcoming poverty is not a gesture of charity. It is an act of justice. That's very, very important what Nancy said. It's not charity to help children in poverty. It's not just some nice thing that we do that's extra. No, it's justice. Because childhood poverty, children starving, children growing up without education and resources, that is wicked and unjust. And if you're not angry about it, then something is wrong with you, Aquinas says. It can be a sin not to be angry about the right things. But let's face it, most of our anger ain't very righteous, is it? I mean, mine's not. Most of our anger isn't about injustice in the world. Most of our anger is about ourselves. Most of our anger is, is petty. In the Bible, the great example of sinful anger is King Saul. You know his story? King Saul, he, he was the king before David. And Saul begins to be insecure about his power. And then along comes this man named David. And David is a great warrior, and everyone admires him. And then, then Saul begins to be envious of David. And by the way, Aquinas gives a great definition of envy too. He says, envy is sorrow, sorrow at the good fortune of others. So if something good happens to somebody else and you're sad about it, that's envy. So Saul then feels envious of David, and then out of envy grows his irrational anger towards David, this irrational, immoderate desire for revenge when David hasn't even done anything, but Saul thinks he's a threat. Saul is the image of anger in the Old Testament, and he takes his vengeance on David or tries to. Um, this happens to us, doesn't it? We feel like this. I, I, I heard a story 
I wasn't there, but I heard the story from another, another pastor, actually a priest. A priest was officiating a funeral for a mother. And at the end of the funeral, the family was gathering in fellowship like they do. And this priest happened to overhear a conversation between this mother's two children, a brother and a sister. And he heard the sister say to the brother, today is the last day we're ever going to speak. This happens, doesn't it? Our anger towards each other is destructive and it pulls apart families and it ruins lives. It diminishes our existence. This is really the anger that most of us struggle with. And this anger isn't righteous. It's a sin. In Dante's, Dante, the, the Italian poet, you've heard of him. He wrote this book about hell. <laughs> he describes in this book the specific punishments that each sinner faces in the afterlife. And it's organized according to the seven deadly sins. You've heard of those, seven deadly sins? And you might call Dante sort of the, the best example of the idea that the punishment should fit the crime. Because in Dante's poem, the sinners that are in the afterlife are punished specifically according to the sin they committed in life. And you know how Dante describes the punishment of the angry they're inundated with smoke. In, they're filled, they're surrounded by smoke and they cough and they can't see and they wander around and they can't speak correctly. That's what anger is like. Anger robs us of our ability to see clearly. Nobody sees clearly when they're angry. Anger robs us of our ability to communicate like smoke does. You can't speak through smoke. And have you ever heard somebody angry try to express themselves? They sound like lunatics. They don't make sense. Anger robs us of our reason, too. That's what's so brilliant about Dante. The angry in the afterlife are inundated with smoke because that is what anger does to us. It inhibits our clarity of vision. It robs us of our ability to speak or to think clearly. Gregory the Great, he lived in the, in the 6th century, that's him. I like that picture of him. He's always depicted with the Holy Spirit over his shoulder. Gregory the Great has a good description of anger. I have to share it with you. He said, The heart goaded by the pricks of anger is convulsed. The body trembles. The tongue entangles itself. The face is inflamed. The eyes are enraged and fail utterly to recognize those whom we know. The tongue makes sounds indeed, but there is no sense in its utterance. Isn't that an angry person? Right there. That's what the sin of anger does to us. So how do we control our anger? How do we keep ourselves from having this sinful kind of anger? Well, the psalm gives us the first key, and it's fairly obvious, which is that this psalm is the expression of anger in words. We speak our anger we talk about that feeling. And I know I sound like a therapist, but that's because the therapists are right. The way we keep an emotion like anger from controlling us is by speaking about it. We speak about it maybe to our partner, our spouse. We speak about it maybe to our therapist. We speak about it to God. We are honest with God about what we feel. And that's the very first step in not letting anger control us. And that's why this psalm, I think, is in the Bible. I don't think it's because God's encouraging us to be more angry and more vengeful. I think it sets an example that God wants us to express what we feel. In classical Christian thought, we have the seven deadly sins and the seven virtues. I don't, did, everybody's heard of the seven deadly sins, but did you know that there are seven virtues paired with them? I don't know if you knew that, but they are. Each of the seven deadly sins is matched with its opposite, and it's as if each sin is paired with its antidote, right? So take, take for example, uh, these sins. You've got, you've got pride. So what's the antidote to pride? Well, it's humility, right? Humility is what's paired with pride. Humility is the 
cure for pride. What's the virtue that's the cure for greed? Well, it's generosity. So whenever you find yourself feeling these sins, pride, well, you know how to counter it with humility. When you're feeling greedy or selfish, you counter it with generosity. Well, how do we counter anger? What's the virtue that provides the antidote? Well, it's patience. It's patience. And Jesus shows us this. When Jesus is being arrested unjustly, by the way, obviously, the temple guards come to the garden where Jesus is peacefully gathered with his disciples, and the guards come to arrest Jesus, and one of the disciples pulls out a sword to fight these guards, right? And I imagine this disciple's feeling angry and vengeful, and he cuts off the ear of one of the guards. What does Jesus do? Well, the Bible says, when those who were around him saw what was coming, they asked, Lord, should we strike with the sword? Then one of them struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his right ear. But Jesus said, no more of this. And he touched his ear and healed him. When Jesus dies on the cross, does he want revenge? No, he suffers and he says, forgive them. Forgive them, for they know not what they do. Jesus shows us the patience that cures anger. But we know, we know that it's right to be angry about injustice, but we see that most of our anger does nothing but make us irrational and insane. And we hear Jesus tell us that we have to forgive our enemies. Well, and that's one thing too, right? That, that we should let go of anger and forgive our enemies. But what about God? The Bible says that God is angry about sin. The Bible says that God will have vengeance on his enemies. And we might not like the vengeance of God, but what about justice? What about justice? Does evil, does sin just have free reign? If God forgives his enemies, what happens to justice? Well, there's only one way I know of to make sense of this. Maybe you've figured out another, but I'm going to share with you the way I've found. That God does take vengeance on his enemies. God does take vengeance on sinners, and it is the ultimate vengeance. It is a vengeance that goes beyond and is more powerful than human vengeance could ever be. If a man is angry, if a man wants revenge, what can he do? At worst, he can kill his enemy. But Jesus says, right, that that is only to kill the body. The soul, the spirit survives. Or let's say that the man was supernaturally powerful and the man could torture his enemies even forever. Has the man really taken vengeance? Has he really defeated his enemies? Well, not if his enemy is still his enemy. Even if his enemy suffers forever, if he still hates him, if he still rebels against him, then there's no real victory there. God's vengeance is different from human vengeance, I think, in that it's effective. God's vengeance truly kills the sinner and not just leaves him dead, but raises up in his place an obedient servant. In other words, God's vengeance causes repentance. George MacDonald said that the only vengeance worth taking on sin is to make the sinner himself its executioner. That's real vengeance, to make the sinner himself turn and hate his own sin. To truly eliminate the sinner must be to replace him with a loving and obedient servant, and that's real vengeance. That's God's vengeance. God's vengeance on the sinner is to make the sinner a servant. God is angry towards sin, and I think God carries out the ultimate vengeance on sinners. He destroys them entirely. And the only way to do that is not to kill them or to torture them, but to make them hate their own sin, to turn and become a servant of God. As always, George MacDonald said it best. When a man acknowledges the right he denied before, when he says to the wrong, I abjure, I loathe you. I see now what you are. I could not see it before because I would not. 
God forgive me, make me clean or let me die. Then justice, that is God, has conquered and not till then. Not until God makes his enemies turn and loathe their own sin and love him has God truly taken revenge. The revenge that the psalmist asks for in this psalm may not be this kind of vengeance. He may not realize that this is God's vengeance, but this is what Christians do. We have our human emotions and our human anger and our human desire for vengeance, and we take them like the psalmist to God in prayer. And we ask God to take his vengeance because his vengeance is the only truly effective vengeance. Ours is impotent. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you truly defeat your enemies, that you truly take vengeance on sinners. You transform them from rebellious enemies into your loving servants. Your vengeance, Lord, is complete when we turn from our sin and love you. So, Lord, take your vengeance on this world that needs it desperately. Because, Lord, the world, I think, has had quite enough of our vengeance that does nothing but an endless cycle of anger and impotence. Bring your vengeance, vengeance that truly produces righteousness and lovers of the good. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll now bring